Wisconsin Foodie would like to thank the following underwriters. So today, Lid, you're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six. You're going to have two pages. All right? Is that too annoying? No. Hi, I'm Caitlin Cullen. I'm the chef and owner of the Tandem Restaurant, and we are starting our first full week of community free meals. There you go, honey. Good luck. The Tandem has been in business a little over three years. We opened in November 2016. Anyone who knows anything about our restaurant knows that we're always skating on the edge of like insolvency. Check my unemployment letters. Because we're a, a social enterprise more than anything and we probably should have started off being a 501c3, but I was stubborn and was like, no, the hood doesn't need another nonprofit. Like we need to show people that commerce can happen in their communities by virtue of the neighborhood that we're in, which is Lindsay Heights. I decided when opening that we would train folks potentially for their first job or their first job upon re-entry or their first job in a restaurant on the job and compensate them fairly for their time, hoping that we could kind of bridge the connection between like the massively unemployed north side of Milwaukee with the massively underemployed restaurants of the, the downtown area. Like that's always been our goal. And then Arlesia, just for your knowledge, anytime you add something to a pot, add salt. We like to serve people good food, yeah. We like to be a cool place to kick it, sure, but we've always focused primarily on helping people. When we knew that we were gonna have to change like a delivery and curbside format, um, we had to cut the menu down significantly and I just thought like, wow, we have so much food in the walk and it's gonna go to waste. So I thought, well, let's just cook off what we have. And we stopped doing our carry out and delivery and really just focused on community meals. And so Thursday afternoon around two o'clock, I looked at my staff and I explained what I thought was gonna happen and how I thought it was important that we focus on doing the most good and looking back at this time and feeling like proud of what we did. And so this allows us to kind of change what our approaches but keep our mission the same. Um, it might help keep people in just a little bit of money for a little longer and also give them something to do. Like if I had to sit around all day I'd go insane. And for right now, me, Charles and Will are gonna slap together 300 meals. The beef ones are mashed potatoes, carrots, brussels, and the beef itself. How you doing Willy Will? Good. What's today? 323? I got the worst handwriting kit. How bad? Um, no, it's not. Oh, it's cute. The original plan was to freeze meals. I was like, oh my God, we're just gonna make a bunch of meals, throw them in the freezer and people can grab them when they want. And so we made like 85 meals and we froze them all and they didn't stay in the freezer for more than three hours before they were all picked up. So then on Thursday, we kind of re-upped and doubled down and we did 150 meals. And within two hours, 150 meals were gone. Halfway through the day, it was really clear that the need was a lot greater than we thought. It seemed like it was something that we should focus on and continue to burn through everything in the walk-in. Oh good, we have plenty of seafood, okay. Right now I'm labeling seafood jambalaya for the peoples today. I was homeless and I was looking for a job. My girl wanted to be a dishwasher, but Caitlin said she wanted me to do the dishes. But ever since then, I've just been working here making sure the restaurant is okay. This is a trying time for the peoples right now. We just gotta stay positive and keep living. We're taking every precaution. Everybody washes their hands when they get in the door. Nothing that goes out in boxes gets touched by a human hand that's not clean and freshly into a glove. One of our employees is even bringing some masks today. Um, we don't let anyone in the building, so we keep two bodies as runners. Um, and then Lydia just stays on the phones. So that way the runners can be more diligent and like gloves on, gloves off, sanitizing in between passes. So you want one falafel, one yes. corned beef hash, and two beef plates? Yes, please. Okay, sounds good. Just let us know when you're outside and so we'll bring it to you. Well, just a lot of people who don't have means to eat. You know, got kids and I have an elderly friend that can't get out. So I'm basically coming for him. So it's good that they're doing this. A friend of mine, knowing that I have 
problems getting food told me about uh, Tandem and the free meals. It means a lot to me because otherwise I'd be struggling. And I had some smothered chicken and rice that tastes very close to my mom's. <laughs> I haven't had her cooking in a long time. This is like home. It's like comfort. The food is really, really good. <laughs> We're cooking whatever the hell we got. So <laughs> we had a bunch of chicken because our delivery and carryout had been so busy that we brought in three cases of chicken Thursday morning for like frying to sell to people. I don't know, I want to make this feel more fun than horrifying. Like to kind of normalize this moment in time. Like it is okay to go get a free meal if you haven't prepared. You get a lot of folks that you would typically expect to see at like a food pantry or a shelter. Um, and I hope they're happy that like we're making really cool meals. <laughs> I think over the next couple weeks, we're really gonna see a lot of folks, a lot of wage workers, a lot of service industry people who didn't prepare for this, who don't have food at home, who don't have a savings, who are used to eating at work all the time, so they haven't really prepared for this. Well, this is great for people that need help because as you've seen on the news, all food pantries are closed because of the virus and I guess it's not getting much better. And grateful for this place that they're giving out food for free. Oh, you grab that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Two beef, one waffle. Yeah. It feels terrible to set, push someone aside, you know what I mean? And be like, sorry, I don't have anything for you, or you'll have to come back tomorrow. But people have been donating an extraordinary amount. I mean, like some guy came and donated a bunch of stuff from like a food supplier's freezer. Here's 50 pounds of frozen chicken breasts and 20 pounds of frozen crawfish and all kinds of stuff that we can turn into meals for the entirety of this week. We're making our vegetarian option for the day. So one of the donations we got was like an extraordinary amount of lettuce. And meanwhile, we had just bought a case of tomatoes for our BLTs that were on our delivery menu. So just really trying to not let anything go to waste. So these are um, just like a good falafel wrap with a yogurt sauce. We're trying to keep items that we're making I don't know, nutritious. I'm suspecting a lot of people this might be the one meal they get today. Our next focus, because we did decide to do something different and that people have been supporting, is to support other small businesses now. Because we're all in this together. Restaurants in Milwaukee have always looked out for each other. So uh, we are from the restaurant Lucky Luz. I'm the worker there. Um, so we are closing down due to the coronavirus. Um, and then we, since we're closing down, so we decided to donate our fresh produce to um, someone that in need, like Tender Milwaukee. Um, we've got chopped onions, julienne onions, mushrooms, and then we got to figure out what to do with all these peppers. Stuffed bell peppers. Oh, I like that. Vegan or veg? Both. All right. We're all working on something a little different. Anomalous is getting, she put some pulled pork in the oven and she's got some baked mac and cheese getting moving. Will is slapping together some marinated chicken um, that we're gonna grill off and we'll serve that with a twice baked potato. And what the hell else did I say was going with the chicken? Veggies, a variety of veggies. So um, we've got a little bit of carrots left over from what we did today um, and some frozen peas that Anomalous has in a pot and she's gonna cook off and add some of the chopped veggies Lucky Lou's is donating today. I've offered to pay people for whatever they got, but I think they just want to help out. You know, some folks are just literally stopping by and handing Lydia a check. And then we also had some supplementary meals from Emerald City Catering. This is a guy I've never met in my life, and he's just been dropping off boxes of food he can't use. And so they have been dropping off anywhere between 30 and 50 meals every day. So we can at least give people something. I think it's pork and beans. Cool, yep, all right. Today we did nearly 300 meals with their help. So they did 40 and we did the balance. I think we came up at 286. So the goal is gonna be 300 a day. Um, and scaling that as need requires. But it keeps me doing something to help folks, which is what we've always done here. Maria? There you go. Thank you, stay safe. Come on, girls, let's go. Get them in, Finn, let's go. Typically, we come out about 6 o'clock, and I'll send the dog off to get the cows. 
Uh, once we got the cows in the parlor, uh, the crew usually takes over the milking and then I'll go out to uh, move fences in the pasture. Come on, let's go. When I was a little kid, we had beef cows and when I moved back here to the farm and kind of took over, I was able to you know, convert our beef farm to a dairy farm and milk 60 cows and feed those 60 cows every single day with nothing but pasture. And 15 years ago when I had the idea of uh, trying to milk cows feeding no grain on nothing but pasture, most dairy farmers that I knew kind of laughed at me and thought, well, that's not going to work. And I said, well, we'll see. So 15 years later, I've got uh, my herd of crossbred dairy cows up there that are making it work. In order to ship quality milk, you've got to pay attention to details. One of the most important things is making sure the health of the cows is good. And, and so one of the things that uh, we've made it a goal on our farm is because we drink the milk out of our tank, is that you know every drop of milk that goes into the tank has to be the highest quality milk for me and my family, which is an accomplishment and it's pretty hard to do because there's so many factors every day that can contribute to milk not being the highest quality. You know, generally once the cows are milked and they're off onto their pasture, most days I'm done for the day. And I know that's hard for most farmers to comprehend that, you know, I come out, work two hours in the morning and I'm done for the day and, and come back out 12 hours later and do it all over. So in the middle of those 12 hours could be anything from cutting firewood to, uh, you know, fixing other fences. Over the past 30 years, I've developed what's called a grazing eye. Generally, you stand out here and look around and try to estimate, you know, how tall the grass is. It's intuition, but, you know, really my goal is to lay out the right size of an area that's going to provide my cows with all the dry matter feed intake that they're going to need for the next 12 hours. You know, it's funny that uh, grass and pasture is, is the cow's favorite food and she can eat it 24 hours a day her whole life and never get sick of eating it. I think early on as an organic pioneer, you know, one of the first things that I struggled with was, was the amount of weeds that you just have in a pasture like this. So, you know, as you look across here, you see a lot of tall weeds that the cows didn't eat that, you know, some farmers would think is either ugly or a waste. But to me, it's just diversification. So even if the cow, that weed grew, the cows didn't eat it, that weed still fulfilled some type of a, a benefit to, to my farm, whether it was its roots growing down deep into the subsoil to bring nutrients up that are more available for the, for the plants that the cows do eat. In recent times now, the milk prices have been taking a dip. Um, our expenses are going up faster than, than anything, so uh, we just decided to, to help make ends meet that we'd do something else. And so this hemp craze kind of was pretty appealing, and I guess we're taking a risk and seeing what we can do. So here's a field of hemp. So there's 2,000 plants out there on one acre. Uh, there's two different varieties. So the variety on the lower half is called uh, Abacus Cherry. The reason that we chose this one was because it would be a more hardier plant that would probably have a better chance of surviving outside. So again, just like the unknowns of everything else about growing this, there's a little bit of unknown about when is the correct time to harvest it. So I guess what we're going to do is we're going to be going by the color of the trichomes. So the, the trichomes are what secrete the oil that we're going to be collecting. They basically look like little spines with a dew drop on the end of each one. And so after we pulled off all of the fan leaves and harvested nothing but the flower, we had half a pound of, of dried product off of it, which was pretty impressive, I thought. So I got a thousand of those here. If we can average half a pound on those, that's 500 pounds. And then this variety down here is probably easily going to average well over a pound. So I've got 1,500 pounds is what we're estimating um, at this point. You know, the market that we're going for is a CBD extraction. And so the dried flower market for that is ranging anywhere from $40 a pound to $150 a pound. So we're hoping that you know, our, our organic certification is going to give us an edge on that to keep us up on the higher side of that. It smells great in here. It's, it, I gotta say, it smells like college uh, <laughs> for me. This is, uh, this is pretty incredible. Thanks for having us out here. You're welcome.
Good to be here. What are we doing today? So we're harvesting hemp out of our field. Um, today we're setting up one of our greenhouses to, to hang plants. Um, we've got another setup in our shed that uh, consists of a drying system. The drying system has reached capacity, so we're just hanging plants to just buy a couple days until we can get the dryer emptied out and put some fresh green stuff in it. Well, what's the end result of this product? All right. So, so the product that we're that we're growing is, is CBD hemp. So the leaves contain a small amount of CBD oil, and the flowers contain a significantly higher amount. And this is all part of like a strategy to diversify the, the, the family farm, right? I right. Mean, uh, would you mind showing us the operation today? Yeah, to yeah, we'll take the out. tour of the whole thing. Well, I know that back in the mid 1900s, hemp was a pretty big crop in Wisconsin. Talking with my dad, he can remember that there was a few farmers around that had been growing hemp for uh, the fiber. But as, as a CBD crop, there's been no history. So. So this uh, place where we're growing the hemp this year was uh, is one of my pastures. You know that uh, that concept of regenerative agriculture. Do you feel like that's kind of the the newest horizon? You know. Yeah, because from from a perspective of being an organic farmer, one of the one of the philosophies with organics is to always try to do better. Mm -hmm. You know, the big thing is to, to stick with with kind of my belief system. And so my belief system with the dairy was you know, low input and organically. Sure. But you know, they're an amazing plant, they're hardy. I mean, yeah. you know, a weed's job is to grow and make a seed. Mm -hmm. And so if, if they can get in the ground and grow, they will. That's incredible. So they're doing it, yeah. For those of you at home who don't know, or maybe aren't as familiar with what this smells like and feels like, you know, to, to put it in a way that's translatable, I always think that there's, uh, there's definitely like a pininess that's associated with really, you know, wet cannabis. Um, I think that that also is like accented in, in hops. You know, when you get a really hoppy beer uh, and it's, it's that, that taste and that sensation that kind of like, bah, knocks you back a little bit. That's so much what these smell like. And they're, they're actually so laden with oil that they literally are juicing off on my fingers. And it's sticky, it's a resin. It's truly an incredible plant. Doesn't that smell good? Yeah, it's sticky, ooey, ooey gooey heaven. Hey Steve. So this is my friend Steve. Hey Steve. He's uh, hey, one on, of the Steve. members of our no, co-op. Right. <laughs> Why a co-op? Why not a co-op? Aha, that's the answer. That's the sandbagged answer. I'm looking yeah. for it. And it, it, the reason for me is uh, protection um, and the ability for us not to have to compete against each other for that same market share. So we started doing group buys together uh, and purchasing seed together, purchasing equipment together. And then we decided to continue on and now we're going to be forming our own brand, our own South Central Hemp uh, CBD oils and, and other products together. So. I'm also a veteran, so I formed an organization with a number of other veterans in the state called Wisconsin Veterans for Compassionate Care. And um, that just one thing led to another, and I got a call, hey, the governor wants to announce this in his budget, and uh, you know, we would like to invite you to speak after him and tell, tell the story. I had my third back surgery in 2016 and I had been running a 20 acre certified organic CSA operation at that time and so then I had to stop farming. Well CBD is just one of over a hundred different cannabinoids that's found in the cannabis plant. THC would be another one. I find it very helpful for me personally when I'm dealing with pain without the, the you know psychotropic high that you get with THC. I don't like to paint rosy pictures. I mean it's going to take a lot more than hemp to save the dairy industry. Can it, can it help a few farms pull through and make it through until hopefully conditions change? Yeah, I think it can, but it's hard work. So it might not be for every farm out there. Kevin, I mean, <laughs> what am I looking at here though? I mean, this is, uh, this is some farmer ingenuity. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a homemade dryer system that I built. Um, we've got blowers on the end of it blowing air. Uh, these trays have uh, 
uh, mesh bottoms in them so each tray stacks on top of each other to allow the air to blow up through it. And then we've got dehumidifiers in the back of the room to pull out the humidity. What is in here is um, flowers and leaves off of the hemp plant. So the, you know, the aroma is coming directly from the flowers. Where does it go? Um, so right now we're working with a processor who's organic to, to process this into oil for us to give us a product that then we can go out into the retail world with and, and hopefully um, you know, yeah. have markets to sell it. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, this is pretty uh, eye-opening and it's, I mean, it's amazing. I'm, I'm actually, uh, a strange word, but I'm really proud of you guys for uh, being able to put this together and uh, take on this endeavor as a way to uh, sustain the multiple generations of farming that have happened right here. I've had beagles ever since I was eight years old. My dad got me my first beagle. I've been a diehard rabbit hunter ever since. I should use the term rabbit hunter loosely because I very rarely ever get any. Beagles are quite the dog. Everything that happens to a beagle through its brain goes through their nose. They're relentlessly happy. They have no manners. They don't listen very good at all. They're not very smart, but they can smell a track and, and follow it for miles. Hey boys. Hey, hey, Wisconsin hey, hey. Foodie on, would like go. to thank the following underwriters. The dairy farmers of Wisconsin are proud to underwrite Wisconsin Foodie and remind you that in Wisconsin, we dream in cheese. Just look for our badge. It's on everything we make. At Organic Valley, our cows make milk with just a few simple ingredients. Sun, soil, rain, and grass. And grass. And grass. Yeehaw! Organic Valley grass milk. Organic milk from 100% grass-fed cows. Employee-owned Nugler's Brewing Company has been brewing and bottling beer for their friends, only in Wisconsin, since 1993. Just a short drive from Madison, come visit Swiss Wisconsin and see where your beer is made. Wisconsin's great outdoors has something for everyone. Come for the adventure, stay for the memories. Go wild in Wisconsin. To build your adventure, visit dnr.wi.gov. From production to processing, right down to our plates, there are over 15,000 employers in Wisconsin with career opportunities to fulfill your dreams and feed the world. Hungry for more? Shape your career with these companies and others at fabwisconsin.com. With additional support coming from The Conscious Carnivore, from local animal sourcing to on-site high-quality butchering and packaging, The Conscious Carnivore can ensure organically raised, grass-fed, and healthy meats through its small group of local farmers. The Conscious Carnivore, know your farmer, love your butcher. Additional support coming from the Barocco Food Co-op, Central Wisconsin Craft Collective, Something Special from Wisconsin, Crossroads Collective, the La Crosse Distilling Company, as well as the Friends of PBS Wisconsin.